in Daniel chapter eight, it talks about in the last days, there's going to be a king in the West that would have the personality of a he goat, which, which is known for its stubborn disposition. And he will make his nation very great. And he will be moved with Chawler, C-H-O-L-E-R. And it's a King James word. But if you look it up, it means to, uh, to have a peevish personality, which is irritated by small slights. And he will attack uh, a leader of Persia. Now, Persia is the ancient name for uh, Iran. Well, today, January 3rd, uh, 2024, is the fourth year anniversary of when Donald Trump air attacked uh, Persia's leader and killed him with a drone attack. And the Bible states in Daniel chapter 8 that he would not touch the ground, this he goat would not touch the ground, but would air attack uh, from uh, on the other side of the world, he would air attack the leaders of Media and Persia, which is Iraq and Iran. So we're seeing Bible prophecy being fulfilled on our television newscast, but most people are unaware of what is going on. So that's where we're at today. And well, they had a celebration in honor of uh, the, memory, the memory of General Soleimani, who uh, Donald Trump had assassinated through this drone attack. And when he took him out, um, they were celebrating it today. Well, today there was a bombing there. Somebody set off some bombs there and they were bowing and screaming death to America and death to uh, Israel. Well, the Bible states in the uh, 12th chapter of the book of Zechariah, Zechariah was a Jewish prophet. And it says in verse two, behold, in the last days, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling, speaks of, and all the people round about it. And then it states in verse three, in that day, I will make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people and all that burden themselves with it shall be cut to pieces, though all the people of earth be gathered together against it. And this is talking about what you're seeing now as the uh, sentiments toward the world is dissipating toward Israel as they're committing genocide against the Palestinians. And uh, the Bible says that anything or anyone who stands with Israel in these last days, when they're going to go getting ready to go through their seven year of tribulation, that's going to make Jerusalem a burdensome stone, Jerusalem the capital of Israel, and all of them that burden themselves with it shall be cut to pieces. Well, it states in Daniel chapter eight that after this king of the West is broken from his seat of power, he being the horn is broken from the head as the head of state of uh, his, his nation, that his nation will be divided into four pieces. So we're just looking at, you know, the decline of America as a world superpower. And it states that in one of those four pieces shall come the little horn, according to Daniel chapter eight. Well, the little horn is the antichrist and he shall make himself very great. So we're looking at Bible prophecy un unfold piece by piece. Now the Bible states, that this won't occur immediately, immediately, immediately. Because why would Christ say, when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, be not troubled for the end is not yet. And then it says in Daniel chapter eight, for at the time of the end shall this vision be. Now in Daniel chapter eight, it forecasted the rise of Alexander the Great. But he said, this vision will again serve in the end times or the last times. And uh, we're seeing it, uh, play out right now in our lifetime. So we are very well on the verge of seeing a lot of catastrophic things take place in America and on the world stage. But the Bible says these are the beginning of sorrows, but our hope is not in America. Our hope is in who? Jesus Christ. But tonight we're going to be in Romans chapter 8, <clears throat> looking at the last few uh, verses. And it says, uh, verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, tribulation period? No. Shall distress? No. Persecution? No. The churches came through all the persecution, all the distress, all the tribulation. Shall famine? One of the horses of the revelation? No. Nakedness? No. Peril? The last days perilous time shall come. Shall peril separate you from the love of God and Christ? No. Shall the sword? When they begin killing Christians, the Bible states in the last days they're going to be beheading Christians for their faith after the rapture of the church, hopefully, but we don't know. Uh, we've been persecuted before uh, by Roman Catholicism when they were going through the world and 
and taking out born again believers who were not a part of their church. He says, no. Verse 36 says, uh, as it is written, for thy sake, we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. The Bible says not only is it given for you to receive Christ as your Savior, but it is also given for you to suffer for his name's sake. We don't really uh, talk about that too much in the church because in this comfortableness of this Laodicean church age, where Laodicea means the rights of the people, we have failed to really proclaim the gospel. We have all these other Bibles out that are not Bibles. When you have a, a new Bible come out, in order to get a copyright, it has to be significantly different from the other Bibles. So when you have a Bible that's supposed to be the word of truth that is significantly different, then you're talking about lies. So when you look in uh, the new Bible, such as the new international version, the new American standard, it doesn't say God was made manifest in the flesh. It says he was made manifest in the flesh. It doesn't say I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. It doesn't say a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. It says a virgin, then it has all these footnotes beside it. And you go read the footnote and says, a young woman shall conceive and, birth, uh, and, and bear a son. Why? Because they're forever trying, the new Bibles are forever trying to take the deity away from Jesus Christ. They're called the Alexandrian manuscripts. Well, in the Bible, if you look in the book of Acts, you have three cities. And out of these three cities, you have the three manuscripts that Bibles are taken from. You have the King James Version, which was taken from the Antioch manuscripts. Okay, They were first called Christians in Antioch. God is letting you know, use that Bible. Then you have the Alexandrian manuscripts. They were found around 1860. And they're older than the King James manuscripts because the King James manuscripts were not written on papyrus, so they didn't uh, survive. So they said, we have the older manuscripts, but they were written from what? Egypt. The Bible says, woe to those who go down for Egypt for help. And then it talks about Alexandria in the book of Acts. Every time you see Alexandria, it's always associated with false doctrine. We had a uh, church father, the Bible says, call no man father, but of course, Europeans don't believe the word of God. So they say, we have these church fathers where a lot of them were from Alexandria and they began to corrupt the text. Okay. So we have a lot of corrupted texts and they're always, they made like uh, 6,000, 6,000, uh, what do they call them? Changes in the text. And they brought forth these new Bibles, a new international, new American, new, 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 new. And it always is deleting black history from it. But aside from that, it's always taking away from the deity of Christ. Okay. So you might want to be very careful when you start reading these other translations. The Bible says, uh, remove not the old landmarks which your fathers have set. Back in 1850, if you were to go into a bookstore and ask for a Bible, you had two choices, the King James or the Catholic. And the Catholic Bible is another city that's mentioned in the book of Acts. And that city was Rome. They spoke the Latin. So you got the Latin Vulgate. You got the New American Standard. That Latin Vulgate comes from Rome. You got the New American Standards and the NIV that comes from the uh, Alexandrian manuscripts, the corrupted text. And then you have the King James Version, which comes from uh, the tradition of Christianity, where they were first called Christians that were Antioch. They're called the Texas Receptus. So that's what you're getting from. Now, the Bible talks about that we're going to be suffering persecution for righteousness sake. When you look at the new King James, the Bible states in the old King James, what the Bible tells us to use, the old is better. It says that uh, Hebrews 10.10, 10, it says, let's turn over there real quick. So I'm going to get ahead of myself. Hebrews. 10, 10, it says, uh, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Christ once and for all. Notice it's past tense. It says we are sanctified by the offering of the body. Uh, and that's a past tense situation. Now you go to the 
uh, the birth. Let's see here. And uh, the new, the new King James, let me go to it. And let's see what it says there. Because it's talking about in the new King James, it says you are being sanctified, not you are sanctified or have been sanctified. In the new King James, it says you uh, have, we are being sanctified through the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's like, wait a minute, what's going on here? We, we're not, uh, we're not being sanctified. Verse 14 in the King New King James, for by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. No, we're not being sanctified. Verse 10 already stated in the same, in the same uh, chapter uh, that we have been sanctified through the offering. So the Bible itself rebukes them. Generally, when people bring forth false doctrine, within a few verses of that false doctrine is the truth that rebukes them. Because what? God saw them coming. Going back to Romans chapter 8, <clears throat> it says, Nay, in all these things, the stress, persecution, nakedness, famine, peril, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Every time you see God talking about us, his love toward us, it's always past tense. Like it says, through him that loved us. It's not that he stopped loving us, but that God calls things which are not as though they already were. To him, <laughs> he died for our sins before the world was. The Lamb of God was slain from before the foundation of the world. He loved us and gave himself for us. Generally, when you, for God so loved the world, it's always past tense if you start noticing those things. But uh, most people don't. And then Paul says, for I am persuaded. But this is what we're going to be focusing on tonight, hopefully. I am persuaded. And the Bible tells you and I to be fully persuaded in our own mind. I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth nor any other thing that's in creation shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now, when we read these things, we just kind of gloss over them like, yeah, 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 yeah. We can't be separated from the love of God in Christ. Okay, let's unpack these things because when you, the Bible tells us not just to hear the word, but to meditate most people just have a surface understanding of scripture. They don't meditate on the deep things of God because when God speaks, his word is endures forever. The same word we're hearing today, we're going to be hearing 10 million years from now, 10 billion years, 10 trillion years from now. Why? Because his word is established forever. He says, I am persuaded, let's unpack all this, that neither death can separate you from what? The love of God, which is where? In Christ Jesus, where you are located. The Bible says when you receive Christ Jesus, the Lord, the Holy Spirit baptized you into his body, the body of Christ. You're baptized into his death and raised in the newness of life. What is life? Christ says, I am the way, the truth, and what? You are the way, raised in, the, in, in Jesus Christ. He that has the Son has what? Life. Paul said he's persuaded that neither death can separate you from the love of God. What is death? What is death? Death is the separation of your body from your soul. The Bible says the spirit, the body without the spirit is what? Dead. So faith without works is dead. Paul says that when you leave this world, death cannot separate you from the love of God. That means you're still existing. And also, what is death? The Bible says the wages of sin is what? Death. So as a born-again believer, since Christ has washed away your sins and has died in your place to take away sin, to wash his blood washes away your sin and to give you eternal life, that death itself, the wages of sin itself, can no longer separate you from the love of God in Christ. Why? Because Christ has been your intermediary. He has been your sacrifice, your substitute. He has been your, the Bible talks about him being your, uh, the person that steps in and pays your debt. Okay. 
he paid the death sentence that was on you so that no longer can death reign over you or threaten you, okay? Not even, no way to sin. No sin you can do can cause your a death to happen to you that can take away you out of the love of God. What do you mean? Let's say that you were a born again believer and something happened so catastrophic that you get so depressed that you kill yourself. Now the Bible, under the law, it says, thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not kill. So you killed yourself. So if you're dead, can you ask forgiveness for that sin? No. So then how are you going to get forgiveness for that sin? Because you died with that sin on your soul, they'll tell you. You must understand what salvation is. He saved us from our sins. Past, present, and future. And the Bible states in Romans chapter 5, verse 13, that where no law is, sin is not imputed, which means counted against you. What does that mean? That means when you're not under the law, although you have broken the law, sin is not counted against you. The Bible states, I believe in the fourth chapter of Romans, that sin is imputed when there is law, but you are not under the law, but under grace. You are literally being saved by grace. Why? Because if you were under the law and you broke it, what does that call for? The wages for breaking the law, sin is the transgression of the law, is what? Death. But since Christ has taken you out from under the law and you broke it, death cannot visit you. Why? Because you're not under the law. I always tell the situation of, I used to go to a Korean church. In Korea, adultery is against their law. In America, you can commit adultery. If I committed adultery and they said, hey, and my wife said, go down there. He's in the Holiday Inn Hotel in room 606. And they break in and I'm committing adultery. Can they arrest me? No. Why not? Because in America, there is no law against adultery. And a crime is when you break the law. Where there is no law, no crime can be committed. It might be immoral. It might be an injustice. It might be uh, uh, a horrible thing to do. But if there's no law against it, it's legal. It's legal. Is it right? No. But it's still legal. The law enforcement officer would say, I'm sorry, Ms. Warden, we can't do anything. But he's committing adultery. He promised before the, in the church. He swore before God. I'm sorry. He can take that up with God. But I can't do anything. Why? because there's no law against adultery in America. Now, had Bill Clinton, when he committed adultery with Monica Lewinsky, they couldn't get him because of the adultery. They got him for lying under oath. That's against the law. But adultery, had he told the truth, wouldn't have been a problem. Wouldn't have been, wouldn't have been impeached. But although we say it's a horrible thing, he did unjustly, even Miss Clinton. I want to beat him up. I want to do all these things to him. Because there is no law, was no law against it, there was no crime. Same with us. When Christ came into the world, he found fault with the law. What was the fault with the law? The fault with the law was that it found fault with us. So why did, why did God give us the law? The Bible says the law was added because of transgression. In other words, it wasn't from the beginning. He says, in the beginning was the word, not in the beginning was the law. Now, false teachers, Hebrew Israelites will say, the word and the law are the same. No, they're not. The Bible states that the law was added for transgression. Since we're saying that, let's go ahead and find that scripture. I always want you to put your eyes on it. Add it because of transgression, transgression. Galatians 3.19. <clears throat> talks about the purpose of the law and it asks let me get out of the King James the new King James Bible go to my old King James King Jimmy here Galatians uh, 3 19 it says wherefore then serveth the law it was added why because of transgressions anytime 
a law is added, it's because someone saw something they didn't like. When African Americans were freed from slavery and the white Southerners didn't like us being free, they made laws that you could not uh, ha hang around with more than three people uh, talking together. Is that a sin? Once you have a law and you broke the law, you're now a lawbreaker and the law enforcement officer can come and visit whatever justice by putting you in chains and putting you in a chain game, putting you back into slavery, whatever they wanted to make, that's what they did. The law was added because something was done and somebody didn't like it. So when God looked at the, the land of Cana and he saw the Canaanites on there, the law was added because of transgressions. What the Bible say? No bestiality. That was one of the laws. No uh, man cannot lie with his niece. And a, a woman cannot lie with her son-in-law. Because these things were going on. These were the transgressions he was seeing. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Why did he say that? Because people were committing adultery. You shall have no other gods before me. Why? Before they were having gods before him, could he say, you're sinning? No, he could say it. The Bible says in Romans chapter 5, verse 13, before the law, sin, which is the missing of the mark, was in the world. But sin is not imputed, counted against you when there is no law. So I always tell you, if Adam would have uh, beat Eve and Eve would go to God and say, he beat me because there was no law against it. It wasn't right, but it was legal. God couldn't say that was, a, that was a sin worthy of death. The only law he had was what? Don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So he could have killed all the animals. He could have did all kind of weird things and wicked things. Would not have been a law, would not have been a sin that imputed against him. Why? Although it missed God's mark, God wouldn't like it. What did God say when he saw Adam do something? He said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make a help appropriate for him. Why? Because Adam had did something God didn't like. Could God say, it's, he's a sinner? No. He'd say, it's not good. God understood good and evil. And then after Adam ate of the knowledge of good, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, then he became like God, knowing good and evil. Okay? The Bible says the law, uh, Romans chapter 3, verse 20, the law gives us the knowledge of sin. We don't know what missing the mark was until the Bible says, thou shalt not covet, which means lust. Paul said, I kept all the law perfectly. I had no other God before God. I remembered the Sabbath to keep it holy. I did not use his name in vain. I honored my father and my mother. I did not kill. I did not commit adultery. I did not steal. You know, I uh, did not have any uh, graven images. But I got to that last commandment. And that last commandment said, thou shalt not covet, which means lust for, anything that is thy neighbor's. And I lusted for power among the Jews' religion. I advanced myself in the Jews' religion. I wanted to be somewhat in the Jews' religion. I was studied under Gamaliel in the Jews' religion. So I found that I had a covetous law. And what did a covetous heart? In the Bible, in Paul's writes in the seventh chapter of Romans, by that little infraction, sin took occasion because of I broke the law and visited death on me. And that's the fault that God saw with the law. He added it to make us all sinners so he could have mercy upon us all. Okay? Because when he made us all sinners, that means we were all worthy of what? Death. For the wages of sin, what is sin? 1 John 3, 4, sin is the breaking of the law, and the ways of breaking of the law is what? Death. So what did Christ do? He said, hold it, Father. I will go and die for their sins. I will fulfill the law. The law has been agreed. The law needs to be satisfied because in Adam, the Bible says, how do we get, become a sinner? We don't become a sinner because we broke the law of God. We were made sinners by one man's transgression. All were made sinners. But by the obedience of one man shall all be made righteous who do what? Believe in that one man. Not behave, 
Religion teaches you behave. That's why many people are going to stand before Jesus Christ and say, Lord, Lord, have I not preached in your name? Have I not cast out devils in your name? Have I not did this and not and, and many marvelous works in your name? And then he says, and then I, the righteous judge, will declare unto me, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. What do you mean iniquity? Because the Bible says if you broke the law at one point, James chapter 2, verse 10, you were counted guilty as of if you broke every single law as a worker of iniquity. I never knew you. But I knew you when you backslid. Because once you're saved, you're placed where? The Holy Spirit baptizes you into Christ in whom is no sin. The Bible says in Romans chapter 4, verse 8, blessed is the man or woman or human unto whom the Lord will not impute sin. Who is that man and that woman whom the Lord will not count their sins? Those who have received Christ as their covering. Those who have received Christ who took the penalty for their sin. In American court justice, they have this thing called double jeopardy. You can't do it. If they try you for a crime, and they find you not guilty, and then you leave, and then they come up with new evidence that see, he is guilty. They can't bring you back and try you for that same crime. It's called double jeopardy. When you were found guilty of being a sinner, and Christ said, I'm going to go and die for the sins of not just what you do up till 2024. I'm going to die for the sins of the whole world the sins from Adam all the way to the sin of the last born. I'm going to die and have all that sin heaped upon me as the Lamb of God. And I'm going to take away the sin of the world. When he died upon the cross, what, what did he do? The Bible says not only was his body, his body was made sin for us. So sin was nailed to the cross. The Bible says, uh, Romans 6, 6, knowing this, that our old man, our human nature, was crucified with him. So our old man, which is the servant of sin, because according to Romans 7, 25, our old man, human nature, serves the law of sin, it also was nailed to the cross. And then the Bible states that God took the law of commandments contained in ordinances, which was against us. Why? Because the law was added because it saw that we were breaking it. Which was against us and contrary to us, the Bible says he took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. Why did God nail the law, which was holy, just, and good, to the cross? Because we couldn't keep it. So to take the law out of our way, he fulfilled it. How did he fulfill the law? By dying for all the sins that were under the law that would ever be happening. He died for the sin of the uh, the mass shooter. He died for the sin of genocide. He died for the sexual sins. He died for the uh, governmental sins. He died for every sin in the world. Christ died for it and took away the sin of the world. So the only sin a person goes to hell for is the sin he didn't take away. And that's the sin of unbelief. You don't go to heaven because you cheated on your taxes or your wife. You go to hell. You go to hell because uh, you you go to hell because you didn't accept the free gift. The Bible says, "By the righteousness of one, the free gift came," and you are not that one. A lot of people think, "I got it. I got to be. I got. I got Negro." Please, you are not that one. I am not that one. Jesus is the one. He's called the Holy One for a reason. He was the sinless one for a reason. The Bible says he was made manifest to take away our sins. And in him, where God placed us, is no sin. Now, when I say God placed you in him, there's a part of you that God did not save. There's a part of you that is a blasphemer of the Holy Ghost. That is a part of you that is anti-Christ. There is a part of you that is against God hostile toward God, and cannot be made subject to the law of God. Turn to Romans chapter, or I guess you're in Romans chapter 
uh, 8 already. Look about around verse 10. <laughs> Let's see here. Let's go around verse 7. It says, Romans 8, 7, because the carnal mind is enmity, which means hostile against God. For it, our natural mind, carnal means natural, meat, is not subject to the law of God. Neither indeed can it be. So no matter how you are told by pastors, you must obey God's law and turn away from your sin. Because of this meathead we got, carnal means meat. Can he concarnate meat? Because of this meathead that we were born with, every last one of us, the Bible says it is not subject to obedience to the laws of God, neither indeed can it be. The Bible says it is, you were alienated from God by the wicked works of your what? Of your mind, not of your hands. Your thoughts are evil. You were born like a Frankenstein. Frankenstein had a body that worked. Everything was good about Frankenstein, except he had a mind that was what? Demented. That's what we are. When we saw God manifest in the flesh, what did we do to him with our demented minds? We crucified him. We beat him 49, uh, 40 lashes, save one on his back. We put nails in his hands and in his feet. A, a crown of thorns upon his head mocked him. Okay, a spear in the side and then sealed him in a tomb. That's what we did to the truth of God, the life of God and the way of God. Why? Because our carnal mind is hostile against God. And do you think we're going to do any less at the second coming? At the second coming in the book of the Revelation, the Bible says that the armies of the earth will turn to fight against him. Okay. And what is he going to do? He's going to destroy them with the word of his mouth. Speak a word. And the blood in that valley of Armageddon is going to be as high as a horse's bridle. Okay? We're still the same. We're not changed. Man is evil from the day he is born. The Bible says you came out of your womb, your mother's womb speaking lies. Okay? You drink. The Bible says do not think above man, above that which is written. What does it say? He drinks iniquity like water. His neck, his neck is stiff. They're stiff-necked people. We don't bow to God. Rarely, rarely, rarely. Muslims bow to God five times a day. Christians don't do that. But who's going to hell? Muslim. Why? Because they didn't receive the forgiveness of sins through Jesus Christ by believing that he died for their sins and rose again. Why is a Christian going to heaven when he's doing things that are carnal according to the natural mind? according to this carnal nature, according to the works of the flesh. Because Romans 7.17 7, says that when you do sinful things, it is no longer you that doeth it, but it's the sin that dwells in your flesh. And ye are not in the flesh. Romans 8.9 says what? Ye are not in the flesh. The flesh is in you. Where are you at? You are in Christ, in whom is no sin. But I don't feel it. Oh, that's what the Bible says. The just shall live by feeling, right? The just shall live by feeling or the just shall live by faith, which comes by what? Hearing what God said. So the Bible talks about neither can death separate you from the love of God. Now today, discouragement and depression plague a lot of Christians. And if you're a believer who struggles with suicidal thoughts and tendencies of God's word, tells you to do thyself no harm, you know. Uh, get to a church that loves you. Not every church is a loving church, but get around people that love you, who will support you, and uh, that you need that kind of support. That's why the Bible tells you not to forsake the assembling of yourselves together as a matter of some, but so much the more as you see the day approaching because depression and darkness, the Bible says these are the beginning of sorrows. When you see these things come to pass, the wars and rumors of wars, Israel being, the Israelis going back to Israel, the Bible says these things are the beginning of sorrows. Just the beginning. Okay? So you need to be able to go among the saints to comprehend the love of God that passes knowledge, which envelops your soul. 
you got to do as David did when he was dismayed. When his uh, he came back from uh, what's the name of that city? Uh, whatever city he came back from, he came back from a war, and I can't believe I can't remember the name of that city. And the uh, Amalekites had came and taken away his wives and the wife of, the wives of all and the children of all of his soldiers to the point that they tried to they they despaired and was going to kill David. And the Bible says that David encouraged himself in the Lord, his God, and so much you. You got to do the same thing. You must encourage yourself because Satan wants you out of this world. So your testimony of God's salvation through Jesus Christ will be silenced. But the Bible tells you to resist the devil. And how do you resist him? With the word of God. It is written, I am more than a conqueror. Do you feel it? No. Just lost my job. Just lost my husband. Just lost my wife. Just lost my spouse. Just lost my girlfriend. Do you feel it? I am more than a conqueror through him that loved me. The love, again, is not past tense. Okay? It's always present with the Lord. Because when God sees everything, it's all past with him because he dwells in eternity. The Bible says right now, you are seated with him in heavenly places. Do you feel that? No. You're still walking through this veil of time, this veil of tears. But the Bible tells you the truth that you are seated together with him in Christ in heavenly places and you've seen him. And the Bible tells us that as he is, so are you now in this world. Well, I'm depressed. Is he depressed? No. Then you're not depressed. You got to renew your mind. Again, your mind is a collection of thoughts. And the Bible says you're to take every thought captive and bring it under the obedience of Christ because Satan will tell you a lie. Satan, the first lie Satan told the first married couple on earth is what? You don't have enough. You lack. And God said, I'm giving you freely everything to enjoy. Okay? What does the enemy come and say? Uh, he's held, he's holding back on you. You don't have this. You don't have this. And Eve started looking at what she didn't have. You'll be like God. You were created in the image and likeness of God. Right now, you are created in Christ Jesus, a new creation that has what? That has the fruit of the spirit, love. Has the fruit of the spirit, joy. I don't feel joyous. Stop looking at life through the lens of your flesh. That's why you've got to get into God's word. It is a mirror that reflects who you really are. It tells you in your flesh dwells no good thing. In your flesh dwells depression. In your flesh dwells sinful thoughts. But ye are not in the flesh, Romans 8, 9. But where in the spirit, if so be, that the spirit of Christ dwells in you. When did Christ's spirit come and dwell in you? When you obey Romans 10, 9, and 10, which states, if you confess with your mouth, it's conditioned, that Jesus is Lord. So you would say, Jesus is Lord. Faith without works is dead. So you need these works. You must believe in your heart, here's the work, that God raised Jesus from the dead after he died for your sins. Do you believe he raised Jesus from the dead? Yes. Then the Bible states, you shall be saved. Do you feel any different? Most people feel the weight of sin. You're saved from what? You're saved from your sin. He's, you're saved from wrath. You're saved from eternal separation from God. You have now become a new creature where? In the flesh? No. You become a new creature in Christ. So you got to start looking at this thing here is getting older and uglier every day. Older and uglier every day. I have this thing on my, on my app, my app here. I don't know if y'all can see it. My beautiful wife and myself. When I was handsome, I'm like, where did that young lady go? And where did that handsome guy go? Because the Bible says our outward man perishes every day, but our inner man is renewed day by day after the image of him. And one day when we see him, we shall be like him, high and lifted up. We sang that song on Sunday. Show us... <clears throat> Show us the, uh, show us your heart, Lord. We want to be with you. You are high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out the power of love. 
We sing holy, holy, holy. Oh, that's going to be us. That's we are going to be. That is us. As he is, so are we now in this world. So we've got to get out of the mindset of you got to fight against. It's a fight of faith. Satan's your your the human nature is the nature of sin. It's the nature that fights against the spirit of Christ in you. You have the spirit of Christ in you that is as holy as God, is as perfect as God, and as righteous as God. You got a human nature that hates God, that does not want to hear the word of God, that could care less about coming to Bible study, and has better things to do with its time than to waste it hearing the word of God. You got these two natures in you. One wants to go to church, can't wait to go to church, wants to hear the word of God, feeds on the word of God, only eats the word of God. That's Christ in you, the new man. You got the old man that lusts for the things of this world, that lusts for the power of this world, the money of this world, the sex of this world, can't get enough of the food of this world, the fashions of this world, wants to dress nice, look nice, be nice, be rich, be, 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 be. Only thing that satisfies the flesh is death. That's when it stops wanting. Our problem is in the wanting because it's, it's like hell. It's never consumed. It's never fulfilled. It wants more. It wants more. It wants more. Christ says, uh, be content with such things as you have. What do you have? All things are yours. But I don't see it. You don't walk by what you see. The Bible says that we're going to be on this earth some three score years and 10. That's 70 years approximately. Then it says, for those of us who have taken care of our bodies and God has been gracious unto us and you live to be four score years, 80 plus years, the Bible says you soon fly away. We're like, I'm holding on for dear life. <laughs> Bible says in the day that you're called to be with the Lord, there's nothing in your body that you can resist it. You're going to go. It is appointed unto man once to die. Okay? So when we are on this little treadmill of earth, we're all marching toward the grave. Marching toward the grave. Now, that's not something that we rejoice at, but the Bible says to live is Christ and to die is what? Gain. When you get your mind renewed to the point that if they gave you a million dollars, it does not change your love for God. If they took away your home, it does not change your love for God. When you get yourself rooted and established in the love of God, nothing can shake you. Because the Bible says, Everything that can be shaken will be shaken, okay? So that only the things that cannot be shaken shall remain, okay? Right now, we see T.D. Jakes going through a shakening. Now, he's been forever preaching and establishing us in the faith that when you, you're going to go through the shaking, but he's going through the shaking now, and he has to eat his own cooking, that you got to put your critics aside, you got to put these people beside, beside. Your sins have been forgiven. You've been washed in the blood. No matter what they say, Christ does not see you that way. Christ sees you where? In him without sin. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord will not impute sin. Okay? You got to renew your mind because people will forever hear a rumor about you and try to keep you there forever. You did this, so you're always that. You did this, and you're always that. That's why we don't really like going to our uh, family reunions. We don't like really going sometimes to our uh, high school reunions. Because people are made, I remember when you, and I remember when, and that's all they got. Don't give your enemy ammunition, okay? Ignore your critics. Cry, they talked about Jesus. You think they ain't going to talk about you? You think they ain't going to talk about you? They talked about Jesus in the church. The religious people crucified Jesus. That's why Christ said, uh, make yourself friends of the drug dealers, of the unrighteous mammon, of the whores, the prostitutes, the pimps. Why? Because when these people, the religious people, throw you out, these other people will receive you. Okay. Strange, strange, strange. I was listening to a marriage counselor. He said, you know what? I've counseled Christian couples and I've seen them get divorced. And you've never seen a divorce until you've seen a Christian couple get divorced. He said, the worldly people can almost do it better than us. They just leave. But Christians, they fight and this and that and the other. I'm like, wow. 
the world's like, ah, that was it. So we're done. And go. We, and God, I didn't say it. And God, here I'm right. Why is everybody, the problem is when we ate of the knowledge of good and evil, that puffed us up. I'm better than you. When the Bible says there's none righteous, there's none in good standing with God, but I'm better than you. The Bible says when you get before the Lord and you have did things without the motivation that is proper, that is going to be burned up. But you know what us foolish people says? Well, I had more things to burn than you did. That's how foolish the natural mind is. I'm better. I'm better. No, the Bible says ye are dead. And your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is our life, we think that this is our life. Me preaching to you is my life. No, the Bible says Christ, who is our life. I want you to put your eyes on it too. First of all, look in Romans 8 and 9. Ye are not in the flesh. I'm so, I'm so depressed. Your flesh is depressed. Let that nature alone. That nature can do nothing but bring you. The, to be carnally minded is, look at verse 6. To be carnally minded, depressed in your carnal mind is what? Death. But to be spiritually minded, verse 6, is what? Life. And what? Peace. You got cancer, the doctor tells you. And they wonder, why aren't you falling out? Why aren't you crying? I got the, and they push the, they push the Kleenex box over to you. You push it back to them. Did you not hear me? I told you, you had cancer. Our hope is not in this life. I'm an interim pastor at uh, Macedonia Church. We had a pastor there before us, shoes hard to fill. Now, when he was there, he was always telling people, I can't wait to go. I can't wait to go. I can't wait to go. Talk about leaving this world to go be with his Lord. What did Paul say? I'm in a straight betwixt the two. Uh, I yearn to go to be with Christ, which is far better but it's needful for me to stay with you, to build you up in the faith as the body of Christ so I can present you as a chaste virgin to the Lord. He's the one who established Gentile churches. But he wanted to do what? He wanted to go and be with the Lord. When you find older people that get tired of this life, you'll, they'll, they'll say things like, I'm tired. I want to go home. And they're at the house. And everybody's wondering what they're talking about. Home. To be at home in the body is to be what? Absent from the Lord. But the Bible says when we are absent from the body, we're going to be where? In the grave? No, present with the Lord. And in the presence of the Lord is what? Fullness of joy. Now, every one of us today have not experienced fullness of joy. You might have great joy, but then an hour later, it's not there. This is fullness of joy to the point that if we knew what was on the other side, we wouldn't, we'd be like, Lord Jesus, take us yesterday. But what do we do? We, we cleave to this life like our hope is only in this world and that death is going to take us from what we got. Dude, all you got is bills and taxes in a government that oppresses you and takes your money. What do you got down here? Well, I got my children. I got You better be sure that you are going to witness to those children and tell them, do you believe Romans 10, 9, and 10, that you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord? Because they have to be born again. Just because you gave them birth the first time and you love them does not mean that they love you're not going to heaven because they're not going to heaven because they love God. I'm not going to heaven because I love God. I'm going to heaven because God loved me and gave his son for me. Okay? Our love is, is pitiful. We saw us in Peter when Peter said, I don't know the man when stuff got hot. He denied it. Our love wanes. Christ said, I hey. I'm not, your love for me is not based on your salvation. Your salvation is based that God so loved you 
that he gave me for my obedience to be given to you so that you can have eternal life as a free gift, not based on your vows and promises that your lying preachers tell you to make. Now you stop this and stop this and then come to Christ. No, you come to Christ as you are, a filthy, dirty, piggy sinner. Give your life to Christ. They're lying to you. You are dead in trespasses and sins. They go out in that graveyard and ask somebody to give their life. That's how dead you are to God in God's sight. You are dead in trespasses and sins. Now, all you got is hearing. And when you hear the faith and you believe it, he gives you his son, which is life. He gives you his son, the spirit of adoption. And by his son being in you, he says, that's my child. So when you stand before him and he says, well done, thou good and faithful service, servant, don't you start taking vows and promises about how good you preached or what you did for the Lord. You say, it's yet not I, but it's Christ in me that is the good and faithful servant. Because you, you know you're not good and you know you're not faithful. All day, 24-7. None of us are. The good and faithful servant is who in you? Christ in you. We do not preach ourselves. Fools do. The Bible states in Galatians, turn over to Galatians, because we have a we have a false church in the world today with false pastors, and the people love to have it so. The Bible says glory, G L O R, or glory in your flesh. Galatians, I'm in the right chapter. Galatians 6 13. Okay. Let me get the full chapter here. It says, <clears throat> look at verse 12. For as many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh. I am so good since I received Jesus. I used to be this and I'm not this anymore. Well, guess what? You were something. Because the Bible says ain't none of us arrived. Okay. So we don't boast in ourselves. We boast in who? If any man boasts, let him boast in the Lord. What did Paul say? I boast in the cross, I boast in the Lord, and I boast in my infirmities. For when I am weak, then I'm strong. He said, but I become a fool in boasting. I kept the law. I was circumcised the eighth day. But these things which were gained to me, they are stenching God's nostrils. Those I counted lost for Christ. And yea, I count all things but loss. My knowledge of God and all this up here, I, all things for loss. For the excellency of the knowledge of Christ, Jesus my Lord, for whom I suffer the loss of all things and count them but dung, sewage, that I might win Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness by keeping Moses' law, but the righteousness of God, which is by faith in Jesus Christ. Romans 10.10 10 states that when you confess Jesus is Lord, the confession of your mouth is made unto salvation. And when you believe in your heart that God raised you from the dead, that belief was counted for righteousness. For with the heart, man believes unto righteousness. Okay? In verse uh, 13, it says, <clears throat> verse 12, it says, For many desire to make a fair show in the flesh, and they constrain you, to be circumcised, live by the law, lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. Why? Nobody will persecute you for preaching good works. Stop sinning. Stop committing adultery. Stop killing. Put God first. Nobody will preach, nobody will ever persecute you for that. You know what they persecute you for? <laughs> righteousness sake. How do you become righteous? By telling people uh, all your law keeping will still get you in hell because the law is not a faith and without faith it's impossible to please God. And the only person that pleased God was Christ. For by the obedience of one his obedience to the laws of Moses, I made righteous. The Bible says they're going to persecute you for righteousness sake because you're preaching a righteousness that's different from the righteousness 
which is by the law of Moses. You're preaching the righteousness of God, which is by faith in Jesus Christ. And the two are diametrically opposed. That's why the Pharisees kept condemning Jesus. You're not keeping the law. Well, you're, you're not fasting. Your, your people are not fasting. Your, your people are working on the, on, you worked on the Sabbath. You're, why do you suffer persecution? Because he was a righteous man. And a righteous man is not under law. The Bible said the, right, the law was not made for the righteous. But for murderers of fathers, murderers of mothers, it was added because of the transgression. He was a righteous man, but people found fault with him. That's why he was hung on that cross, because he said he was the son of God. And they say, you being a mere man makes yourself God. And that's why he was hung. There was not enough evidence to prove that he was a the Christ. And guess what? As a believer that Jesus Christ is your righteousness and your faith in him, his death, blood, and resurrection made you as righteous as the son of God, the church world will come against you and say, you're a false teacher. What did Paul say? The way that I preach, they call heresy. But so serve I God. Why? Because the law of Moses cannot justify you from your sins. Only the faith in Jesus Christ. But what did the pastors tell you? You must stop your sinning and come to Christ. Give your life to Christ. You can't stop sinning. Why? Because human nature is the nature of sin. Sin dwells in your flesh, even after Christ dwells in your heart by faith. Okay? So you can become a disciple, but they tell you what? In order to get saved, you got to stop sinning. They haven't stopped sinning. Let's read the verse next verse. <clears throat> Verse 13, they desire, neither do they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, neither do these legalists are teaching you to keep the law, keep the law, but they desire for you to keep the law, to be circumcised, that they may what? Glory in your flesh. When I met so-and-so, he was a drug addict, he was a dope dealer, he's a such and such and such, but now, since he's been coming to my church, he's cleaned up his ways, and now he's this and he's that, he's, and you both go to hell because you have not trusted in the righteousness of God, which is by faith, to stand before him. Lord, Lord, didn't I do this? Didn't I stop this? Didn't I start this? Didn't I do many marvelous works? And you'll go to hell thinking that you were righteous by the works you did instead of the righteousness of God, which is by faith in Jesus Christ, whom you persecuted people for as easy believism. So 801, went over one minute. Open up your mics and ask your questions or be pertaining to tonight's lesson or not. Pastor, the scripture that you uh, that you just mentioned where Paul said that they said that he preached heresy. Yeah. Is that Galatians somewhere? Look, I can the book of Acts. Let me see. <clears throat> Acts 24, 14. Acts 24, 14. Okay. Um, so their kind of righteousness, my question is right here, preaching their kind of righteousness. So if we're not preaching their kind of righteousness, uh, then we, we, we heresies. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. When I was, like I said, I was raised up in a church that believed that you were, when you walk the walk, talk the talk, and live the life that yeah. Christ said he was, then you're saved. And if you don't, then you're a hypocrite. Christ died because they thought he was a hypocrite. They didn't believe he was a son of God. Mm -hmm. Do people see you as a son of God, holy and without sin? Is righteous Jesus Christ? No, because our righteousness is in Christ Jesus, not in our flesh. We don't preach ourselves. We preach who? Christ. Jesus Christ, the righteousness. We are clothed with the righteousness of God, which is by faith in Jesus Christ. We don't, we don't preach ourselves. But these people want you to look to yourselves. Because in the laws of Moses, it says, this is thy righteousness that you keep the law. Mm -hmm. and no one has kept it. Amen. 
But to him that worketh not, but believe in him that justifies the ungodly, his faith shall be counted for righteousness. Romans chapter four, verse five. So when we start preaching the righteousness of God, which is by faith, that's what makes people angry. You got a whole church out there called the Church of God in Christ, which is really the Church of God in the law. And they will teach you you're righteous because you wear long dresses. You're righteous because you don't wear makeup. You're righteous because they're getting a more they're getting more lax now. But when I was raising up, oh my goodness! If you go to go to the movies, you ain't righteous. You you ain't righteous because of this. Your righteousness is because of your faith in Jesus Christ. And what did God say about His righteousness in Isaiah fifty one six? His righteousness cannot be abolished, and His salvation is forever. These same churches will teach you that your salvation is not forever and your righteousness can be abolished. And it can be abolished if you establishing it. But when you establish the word of God in your heart and says, my faith, if you get before God and he says, depart from me, I never knew you. What are you going to say? They say, Lord, Lord, have we not? You have me saying, Lord, Lord, did not Jesus die in my place for my sins? Did not Jesus was raised from my justification? Did not Jesus' blood wash away my sin? They don't say none of that. They say, Lord, 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 have not I prophesied in thy name? They're, they're bragging about their ministries. Yeah. As many will say this, have not I cast out devils in your church? And did many marvelous works. We're not saved by works of righteousness, which we have done. Our salvation is by grace through faith, not of works. They quote the verse themselves, but they don't believe it. They don't believe Why do people go to hell? Because they don't believe the gospel. You ask them, do you have, when I first started going to be teaching in Macedonia, do y'all have sin? Every week, And they sit there scared. Don't ask as many questions. No, I'm asking you, do you have sin? Raise your hand. And I say, Negro, didn't Christ watch away your sins? Yes, put the hand down. Because they're really believing, they don't believe the gospel. They believe that what they do is their righteousness. That's why they say, I have sin. Mm. When I I was going, we have a church down the street around the corner. Is a Korean church I belong to, and they would always ask, when I when I first met them, I went to their church. They said, uh, "Do you have sin?" I said, "You won't understand this, but no." So you're saying you're holy? I said, "You won't understand this, but yes, as holy as the Holy Ghost." So you say you don't have any sin, and you're holy? Yes. So are you righteous? You won't understand this, but yes. I <laughs> And they said, uh, you're the first person. Why are you righteous? I said, because I'm clothed with the righteousness of God, which is by faith in Jesus Christ. I'm a partaker of his holiness through the divine nature of Christ in me. And the Bible says, by one offering has he perfected forever them that are sanctified. And we're sanctified by the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. He said, you're the only person that we've met in America that knows the gospel. So that's why my gospel is called, my ministry is called, Have You Heard the Good News? Because most people haven't heard it. And they go to church every year, every week. The only reason why I'm at Macedonia is because the pastor here heard me one night and said, I know what you said is true, but I don't quite know how to preach it. Could you come and teach us Wednesday nights? He gave me Wednesday nights for one entire year. And then I left, came back 10 years later. He was still preaching. it, And I was like, he's the only person. Other preachers become threatened. Okay? Because they hear it and they say, and you don't get it by hearing it one time. You got to be taught this. Because mm -hmm. your human nature is the nature of sin and it rejects it. It pushes it away. Because it wants to believe that it has something to do with its own salvation. God is my co-pilot, please. You got your hands on the switches? With your carnal mind, get out of here. But that's the foolishness we sing. We sing so many ungodly and unscriptural songs in our churches, it's ridiculous. 
Let the works I've done speak for me. What the Bible say? You better have the blood of Christ, which speaks better things than the blood of Abel, particularly in black churches. It's just ridiculous because our faith is in what? Ourselves. What the Bible says, people perish for lack of knowledge. And when you preach to them, righteousness is by faith in Jesus Christ, not by you acting righteously. The Bible says the grace of God teaches us to how to live soberly, righteously, godly in this present world. But who made you righteous? Jesus. Who made you sanctified? Jesus. Who made you holy? Jesus. The Bible states, turn over to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 24. You're saved by receiving the new man, Christ in you, that cannot sin because he is born of God. Ephesians 4, 24 says that you put on this new man, which after God is created, where? In righteousness. And in what kind of holiness? True holiness. True holiness. Because all this thing we call it holiness ain't holy. Who's the new man is created in true holiness? Right. Holy one in you, Christ in you. Okay. This is our new. This is who we both about. We don't preach ourselves. We preach that in Christ Jesus, I've been made the righteousness of God in Him. I'm a new creature created in Christ Jesus in righteousness and in true holiness. Do you hear this being preached from the pulpits? Nope. And they'll be standing there on Judgment Day having to give account. Why didn't you know it? You had a Bible in your hand. Just like James. People act like, you study the Bible so much and you know so much scripture. No, I don't. I'm the most forgetful man in the world. I'm so forgetful that if I ever developed Alzheimer's, my people wouldn't know. But you know why I know so much scripture? Because the churches that I have been over, including Macedonia, including Tebok, including down at the homeless shelter, and including in Kansas City, and including Africa, every church that I minister to, the people are so hard-headed that I have to go over the scriptures every week, every time, so they finally get it. And I accidentally remember these scriptures. People like, oh, you just went to seminary? You didn't know. I didn't know. No, no. What made me remember from my scripture? Hard-headed Christians. Because they refuse to endure sound doctrine. So every week you got a reminder. Do you have sin? Yes, I got sin. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I can go ask the Sunday. How many people in here got sin? I get I bet you 25% of the people in there raise their hand. And the other 25% won't raise their hand because they know I get on them. But they do believe they have sin. It is the weirdest thing because people refuse to be stabilized and rooted and grounded in the word of God. They're rooted and grounded in the thoughts of their natural mind and what they see and what they think they believe. That is not the gospel. That's why you sit there and look at them. It's like, oh. this weekend, we had a, a little girl to took me to the side and said, wait a minute. Are you saying that I get saved if I say that Jesus is Lord and believe in my heart that God died for my sins and rose again and I'm saved? Yeah. I'm glad she got it. She said, that's good news. I said, yeah, that's good news. I'm glad you got it. Because it's hard to believe. Why? Because you have, when you've been indoctrinated in the, in the Baptist church doctrine, that every time you commit a sin, you got to go get more forgiveness. That means what? You got sin. When the Bible says, by one offering, he perfected you forever. He wants you to turn away from your sin. You've been forgiven of all sins. All the scriptures after the resurrection of Jesus Christ says you have been forgiven, not you are being forgiven. Before Christ died, when the law was in effect, you had to ask, forgive us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive others. And this, this, this. If you get forgiveness based on how you forgive others, you're not going to go to heaven because you haven't forgiven everybody totally. That's right. So that was under the law. Under the new covenant, you forgive for Christ's sake. You've been forgiven for Christ's sake. 
you forgiven because God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. And all, it's always been forgiven, forgiven, forgiven. You've already been forgiven. But the Roman Catholic Church, which dominated all the churches that broke out from her at one time, was teaching, you got to get more forgiveness. So we, in the Baptist church, you keep short accounts with God. Go get this forgiven. Go get this forgiven. If you die with a sin unforgiven, you go to hell, person. That's why he took away all the sin of the world 2,000 years ago. What does the Bible say? Without the law, sin is dead, Romans 7, 8. But they teach you sin is alive and well. Mm -hmm. The Bible says, how are you looking at it? Are you looking at it through God's lens? Are you looking at it through man's lens? We go over this all, all the time. Because the natural man refuses to retain God in its knowledge. Because it thinks it's somewhat. It thinks it has seniority in the church. And it's like, you need to humble yourself and get with the program of his doctrine and his word. Because when you stand before him and give account of how you handled his word and you didn't handle it rightly divided and you were taught to, you, the judgment will be more severe on you than the person who was under the legalist pastor who accidentally got saved because one day he did hear the gospel and believed it. And then after he believed it, went back under law. It's crazy. But the Lord knows those who he is even when we don't. They go, how you doing this week? I need for you to pray for me. <laughs> <laughs> Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, whatever day goes, whatever is afflicting day go, and my wife and other people who are on this call, we know that Satan, we have an adversary and he is aggravating us. He is torturing us with the uh, thoughts of fear and, <clears throat> and all these things. Father, we ask you, Father, for the grace. You said that we could come to you, your throne of grace, and obtain mercy and find grace to help us in this time of need. Father, we don't need prayers answered when we get in front of you because we'll have all things in. We need these prayers answered today, in this time, in this veil of tears down here while we are not in the presence of the Lord where there's fullness of joy. Would you please speedily answer these prayers that are in our heart? The Bible says a heart, a hope deferred makes our heart sick. We've been praying and believing you for things for years that have not manifested. Father, if there's anything in our life that you are displeased with, we ask you to correct it, remove it, so that we can get our prayers answered because you tell us that our prayers can be hindered if we're not treating people right. So, Father, we ask you to reveal to us what is the hampering. And if there is no hampering, we ask you to answer our prayers speedily according to the will of God and the dictates of our heart. We believe you. and We believe that we have faith in you. We know that we've been made righteous in you. We have no sin before you. So, Father, we ask you to come through with whatever we have put before you in petition. And if you're not going to answer it, the way that we decided it should be answered, please answer it and let us know that we have got the answer that we petitioned you for, whether it is a yes or a no. But Father, you said everything in you is yay and everything in you is amen. So we're looking for an affirmative an answer and action from you. This we pray in the name of Jesus Christ for us all. Amen. Amen. You want to yeah. talk about your, uh, your uh, prayer Yes, yeah, so faithful. I, every 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 morning I get up. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, man. I say he makes me shame. I don't pray like this <laughs> every evening. Every yeah. evening. yes, it's a beautiful thing. If you can ever watch him, it's on Facebook under Dago Davis, D A Y G O Davis, and it's live. So we sign up and uh, send him a free friend request, and you'll get his uh, feeds every morning. What well, afternoon? So it be. It'd be as the afternoon uh, at 9.30. It'd be 8.30, you guys' time. Okay. We're so, live broadcast. Yes, yes. I sure not appreciate it. Um, and with that, um, I had my surgery October the 30th. And i uh, been in the hospital for a couple of days. And the hospital here in Muncie, Indiana, um, they kept me, but they wouldn't treat me uh, for the leakage. Uh, however, they said that um, they want to leave it up to uh, my doctor, the one that uh, put this device in me. And um, 
when I got there, my doctor resigned. And I'm seeing a new doctor now. And um, um, I was telling him, I said, well, she left some stitches back there and it shouldn't be back there. He wouldn't cut it off. He saw the uh, the leakage. He put a Band-Aid on it. And he said, I'll see you in two weeks. It's still leaking. And um, I was like, my chest, like you would go outside with no coat on. And um, I've been having sharp pains. Um, I know it ain't supposed to be like this. Mm -hmm. um, to one of my cousins, she's a nurse, and she said they might have uh, punctured uh, your spine. That's why the fluid is leaking the way it is. Oh, my God. Mm -hmm. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, you can see the, the peril that he's in. And although we have the love of God, we need the help of God to get him to a new surgeon that knows what they're doing, yes, the competent hands, and the people that care and have empathy and not just giving out Band-Aids when it should be surgery, Father. Uh, cause them to overcome any fears of being sued and cause them to do what is right. And when in the surgery, Father, we ask you to guide their, their hands and guide them with wisdom that this above that they've even know that they have so that they can have understanding while they're in there to do the right things so that this can be corrected and that he can experience good health father we need our backs we need our spine in the name of jesus christ father we ask you to speed this situation up and get somebody an advocate on this so that uh, he can be healed and not delayed or put off in the name of Jesus, because these people are wicked, and we know that we know that you know someone who can do this and can do it in an appropriate way, effectively, because this is what is needed in this time. We ask you to bring that person forward and cause them to cross paths and be assigned to this case. And Father, we just lean on you in prayer for this, because he is a faithful servant. And he has been praying. He believes in the power of prayer. You've seen his faithfulness. And Father, we ask that you intercede. Jesus Christ, we ask you to intercede for him. You say you sit in the presence of the Father to make intercession for us, making intercession for the transgressors. Father, we thank you for this, uh, for this blessedness that we have with you there. We ask you to pray and bring these things to pass in his life so that he can be healed and this leakage can stop because it can't leak forever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Gosh. I'll work. go in the morning. I want to say thank you, y'all. God bless. Um, got 10 minutes on here. <laughs> okay. You know, on that. <laughs> I would stay. Gotcha. But I got to roll over to that. All right. Y'all take care. All right. Thank you, you. Brother James. All right. Anybody else have any questions? If not, God bless y'all. Take care. Bye-bye.